Section 6.1 does cover some review stuff about series and more specifically power series, which is worth it if you haven't had Calc 2 in a while, right? Or even if you have just to kind of see again and be like, okay, yeah, I remember how to do that. But some of the things that show up end up being like the building blocks for how to get series solutions because series solutions are kind of weird. Most of the work is actually in the simplifying. And you'll see what I mean because the last example in this section is basically what you have to do in 6.2. So generally, that's what a power series looks like, just to start off with some of this review stuff. Um, right? So then down here, all right, we've, we've got one, right? Um, where I guess our C sub n is 1 over n times 2 to the n. Um, all right, but what we're supposed to do with this is find the interval and radius of convergence. So with a power series, if you're gonna to try to find the interval of convergence, I think the best thing to do is a ratio test. So that's what I did here, right? Where I've got it here with the n plus one, and then I guess really divided by the same thing um, with n as the index, except that I multiplied by the reciprocal, just so I could write this easier. But anyway, there's a bunch of cancellation here, right? Because you would cancel all of the x plus ones on the bottom and then all except for one up here. And then you can kind of do the opposite with the two is where you can cancel all the twos there and then all but one down there. So you end up here. But then the x plus one on top and the two on the bottom aren't affected by this limit so you can bring them out front, right? So absolute value of x plus one over the absolute value of two, but that's just two. And then this limit is one, right? So then, okay, multiply the absolute value of x plus one over two by one, you get the absolute value of x plus one over two. So the series is gonna converge absolutely when this thing here is less than one. So for that to be less than one, you would need the absolute value of x plus one to be less than two, which would happen if x is strictly between negative three and positive one. And then, if the absolute value of x plus one is bigger than two, then the series is gonna diverge. Then the endpoints, you gotta check them individually. So when x is equal to negative three, and then I just subbed in the negative three for x. So where there's x plus one raised to the power of n, now I have negative three plus one or negative two raised to the power of n. But then you can simplify this a little bit because um, this negative two to the n and then the two to the n down there, you could write that combined as negative two over two, all raised to the n, but negative two over two is negative one. So this is negative one raised to the power of n over n, and that will converge because that's an alternating series and you can use the alternating series test. Then the other endpoint, the one, okay, there, if you sub in one for x, you're going to have one plus one to the n, which is two to the n. So you get two to the n here, two to the n there, you can cancel those out. But then you're gonna have a harmonic series or the harmonic series, right? Um, the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n, that's gonna diverge. So, okay, that means for the interval of convergence, we gotta include the negative three and not include the one. So there we are, right? Bracket around the negative three, parenthesis around the one. And then the radius of convergence, which I guess really you get up here, right? I guess really it's this step right here that gives you that, that it's gonna be two. So I guess depending on what notation you wanna use, either it's R for radius or rho for radius. That's a bad looking rho, it looks more like a P. I should have drawn that better. But either way, um, that's what you end up with for the radius of convergence here. This page, the second page, is just more Calc 2 review stuff where if you have a function where it's one where if you keep taking the derivatives, you'll get a derivative, so it'll be differentiable, but also you never get zero. So like things like e to the x or sine x or cosine x, those um, are gonna be the most common things that you see represented using a Taylor series. And more specifically for what we're gonna do, if the Taylor series is centered at zero, that's a Maclaurin series, right? Generally, a Maclaurin series is just a special case of a Taylor series. And this is really what you use for the rest of this section and then the next section is using the Maclaurin series. So the common Maclaurin series expansions, there are more in the book, but these four are the big ones. So cosine and sine, um, 
which even if you don't remember what the summations look like, if you just remember like, oh yeah, they alternate signs and one of them has all the odds and the other one's got all the evens, that's probably enough to get the rest of it, I think. Then e to the x, um, I guess this is the most straightforward looking one, unless you want to argue for, for this guy down here. But this is the one that I think everybody can pick out when they see it. Um, right, because that one, like it really jumps out and it's like, oh yeah, that's a McLaurin series. And that I think ends up being the easiest one to remember. Um, and then there is this one down here, which we might need, which is why I threw it in. These are going to show up, these first three. This fourth one, we might need it. So those, I guess, are sort of the greatest hits of McLaurin series expansions. Our book does have a few more, but these are going to be the ones that we're actually going to use. This may actually be the most important step for the rest of Chapter 6, believe it or not. How to shift the index of summation, because you need to be able to do that in order to combine sums together. And there are a couple of different ways to think about it. Um, our book uses substitution, which is not the way that I would reflexively do it. The thing that I would reflexively do is I use a sympathetic shift. So what I do is if the sum goes down, uh, like the starting point of the sum, so like the index on the bottom, then um, the other indices, so like out here, um, the thing you're taking the sum of, those have to increase by the same amount. Um, so I guess I have it with an, an increase on the bottom of the summation, so the starting point of that index, and then a decrease out here in this example, right? Because here, for what you start with, um, I what I'm thinking here, and this is the thing that you actually have to do a lot, you have to end up with an x to the n, let's say. So I need to decrease this exponent by 4. So, okay, well, I can do that, but if you're going to do that, then all the indexes of the thing that you're taking the sum of have to go down by 4. So yeah, I have an x to the n, but I also have an a to the n minus 4, right? So that goes down by 4 from where it was over here. And then the sympathetic shift is if these are going down by 4, this down here, the starting point's got to go up by 4. So that's why over here it starts at n equals 4. So that's how I do it, is I do it with a sympathetic shift. I think, okay, if I have to go up four, or I have to go down four here, then I gotta go up four there, or vice versa. Um, or let's say, you know, I had an x raised to the power of n minus two, I need to go up two here, then I gotta go down two on the index, that kind of thing. So I do it just with a sympathetic shift like that. So you can see my idea here on the left. What our book does is this thing on the right. So what I would do is if I had to write this where the first term, like it says there, corresponds to n equals zero. So that means I've got to have the index for the sum starting at n equals zero, not n equals two. All right, so this is what we're starting with, and I need to get this down to zero. So I'm saying I need a minus two here. But then if I'm going to do a minus two there, then I've got to make the indexes here go up by two. So that's why I've got plus two there. So I can have it. So there's the n equals zero, but then over here, we got to go from a sub n to a sub n plus 2, and then from x to the n to x to the n plus 2. So that's how I would do it. What our book does, and this is fine, there's nothing wrong with this, it's just maybe this is one of those things where the first way you learn how to do it is the one that sticks in your brain, and that's what's happening to me. I mean, that's very true, but it'll get you to the same place. So if you want to use substitution, you say, okay, well, instead of doing what I did on the left side, what if we let m be equal to n minus 2, right? Because we're starting at 2, we want to get down to 0, so we are subtracting 2. So that's where that minus 2 comes from. So if m is n minus 2, then that would mean that n is equal to m plus 2. So then what you end up doing is you, you, know, you start here, right, where we were at the very beginning, and then you just substitute in m plus 2 for n. So there's an m plus 2, there's an m plus 2, there's an m plus 2. But m plus 2 equals 2 on the bottom of the summation, this beginning of, of the indexing there, you can rewrite that as m equals 0. And so then this, what, what I've got here, it's identical to this, just with a different placeholder, right? It's using m for the indexing instead of n, but it's the exact same thing. So either way will work. Whichever one feels like it's easier, I guess do it like that. 
And then there's one more example here, which I guess naturally I'm going to do it with the sympathetic shift because that's what I'm used to. But this is usually the kind of stuff that you have to do right here. Um, more than like that first example where that first one hinged on getting the um, indexing to match up on the bottom of the sum. You do have to do that, but usually that's not the first step. Usually this is to try to match up the powers of x. So let's say instead of having an x to the n plus 2, we want x to the n. Okay, well then we gotta go down two, right? So that's why it says two down here because we gotta get from x um, to the n plus two to x to the n. So that's gotta go down two. That one also has to go down two, but then the one that's on the bottom of the sum has to go up two. And then if you go over here, bottom of the sum goes up two. And then now we have n minus two right here instead of n, so that's a down two. And then n instead of n plus two, that's also down two. So then this is the thing that you would want here. The next couple of examples, this is a big thing for series solutions, being able to rewrite an expression that involves multiple sums as a single sum. Because there are a couple of things that you have to take care of. You gotta make sure that the exponents of the terms are matching up so you can combine the two sums together, and you also need the indices to match up. So this is the key right here where it's a strategy, this part's important. If you, if you do it in this order, it will be the shortest way you can possibly do it, which sometimes is not all that short, but it would be shorter than the alternative. So do the exponents first, um, like of the exponents of the things that you're taking the sum of. Then after that, you match up the starting points of the sums. So watch what happens here, because we got these two sums that we're supposed to add together. The first thing that I'm thinking about, I guess, is that x that's out front in here, I wanna put that back in here, right? That's part of the sum, and I would prefer this as just two sums with nothing out front of either sum, just two sums added together. So all I did was I just put that x back in here, and so that's why in the second sum I've got x to the n plus one now, right? That x to the n is now multiplied by that x inside the summation here. All right, well then, if you go down here, all the stuff that I have underlined in red, that's where all the adjustments happened because what I thought once I got here, once I've just got two sums added together with nothing out in front of either sum, I want the exponents of the x's to match up. Right now they don't. You got an n minus one here, you got an n plus one over here. You could make them both n minus one, you could make them both n plus one. It's probably easier just to make them both n. So for this first sum, I need to go up by one, right? To get from n minus one to n. So that means that for each of these, that n, that n, and that n, I gotta go up by one, and then consequently I gotta go down one here underneath the sum. All right, so you go down here, there's the going down one, right now this is a zero, and then every place where there was an n, I just replaced it with an n plus one. So there's n plus one, there's an n plus one, and then this is n plus one minus one, which is n. Second sum, I need an x to the n. So I gotta go down one here. Then I also have to go down one on this index right here. Then I gotta go up one underneath the sum. So going down here, up one underneath the sum, and then there's an n minus one, there's a down one, and then n instead of n plus one, there's another down one. Okay, so now where we are is we have the exponents here matching up, but now the sums don't start at the same index, right? This one starts at n equals zero, this one starts at n equals one. We want them to start at the same place. So how do you handle this? Well, the one that starts earlier, you could pull a term off or a couple of terms off if you have to pull a couple off. Here we don't, here we just have to pull off one. Because what we could do and you can see it down here. These two things added together, that's this first sum. All I did was I pulled off the first term because when n equals zero, you would get one times a sub one times x to the zero, which is that. So I just pulled that one off and then I said, okay, for the rest of them, to get all the other terms, you would just start the sum at n equals one. And the reason I did that is because then we have two sums here that have x to the n in them and they both start at one. So then you can combine those into a single sum. And then this a, or I guess a sub one, is just gonna be kind of floating out front. So this is really the answer that you end up with here. Because now, 
since you got x to the n in both and you've got um, n equals one as the starting point, then you can combine these together. And then really you just end up with a big coefficient of x to the n, right? Where you have the n plus one uh, times a sub n plus one, and then plus from the second sum, a sub n minus one. And that's that, right? And you just have this single term out front. This will happen, there's nothing wrong with having these. Um, essentially what that would tell you is that if this was a series solution, then one of your independent solutions is just like a constant. So like, like one, basically. Um, and then you could view the A1 as just like the arbitrary constant that gets multiplied by it. So this does happen. Um, because you think, well, it's supposed to be just a, a single series. Yeah, but sometimes you do get stray terms out front, which you need just to be able to combine the two series together into one series. So there's nothing wrong with having that A1 out there. Next, this is kind of the same thing, but it's worth going through a couple of these because this is such an important concept. So we've got our two sums that we want to add together. And, well, the indexes don't match underneath the sums and the powers of x don't match. So that's what you want to do first, the powers of x. Once again, I figured it was probably better just to get them both um, to be written as x to the n rather than having them both be x to the n minus one or x to the n plus two. So, okay, first sum, what do I have to do to it? Well, I need to go up one with this power right here. That means I also have to go up one there and up one there. And that's what I've got, right? n plus one, c sub n plus one, x to the n. Then you gotta go down one on the sum. So down one, n equals zero. Okay, next. The other sum, I have an x to the n plus two. I need to go down two to get that to x to the n. So down two here, down two right there, and then it's gonna have to be up two down here to balance it out. So down two, right, c sub n minus two, down two here, and then up two, so instead of n equals zero, we got n equals two. All right, well, we've got x to the n in both of these sums, but now the starting points don't match. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to start the sum at two, so at n equals two, and I'm gonna to have to pull two terms off of this first sum. So when n equals zero, you get this, right? You would get one times c one x to the zero. When n equals one, you get this right here, because you'd have two times c sub two times x to the first power. And then the rest of it, you could write as a sum starting at n equals two. Um, and then it's the same sum that it is there, right? But now we're at a point where We've got two sums where we have the same power of x, and the sums are starting at the same point, where they're both starting at n equals two. So then you can combine those together. And I guess you can put that three in here if you want to, even though I didn't write it like that here. Um, or you could write that as the sum from n equals two to infinity of three c sub n minus two times x to the n if you wanted. Um, but then down here, I guess these first two are just kind of hanging out, out in front of the sum. And then we've got the sum from n equals two to infinity of, and again, you get a nice big coefficient for x to the n. So it's this first piece, and then I guess plus three times c sub n minus two, right? And that's that, right? I mean, now that's written out with a single sum in it. Um, and this time we had a couple of stray terms out front, but they happen sometimes. This next example looks pretty long, but part of that is just that I rewrote every piece in every line. So those red underlines like that and that are just supposed to point out the parts where I did something um, in the next step. So where there's gonna be something that changes. But what we're supposed to do here is we're supposed to verify that this power series right here is a solution of this differential equation. Okay, well, if that's what y is, then y prime would be its derivative. And you say, okay, well, if you had this all written out, it would just be a bunch of power rule derivatives or bringing down the 2n and then x to the 2n minus 1. So I did it here, um, and there should be an n up there in that power, by the way. I, I kind of forgot that. It's in every other step, but there should be an n up there. Um, all right, so the other thing is I started the sum at 1 and not 0, and that's just because when n equals 0, you're going to get 0. 
right? Like if 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 n is zero and you sub zero into this, right there you're going to get a zero. So um, you just wouldn't include that. That's why I'm starting at one, right? Or I guess you could say, well, the first term is a constant, so you take its derivative as zero, so you wouldn't include that in the sum, right? You end up in the same place. All right, so this is the thing where we're supposed to make sure that this is equal to zero. We're supposed to verify that it's equal to zero. So I subbed in this sum as y prime, right? That's what it is up there. And then this one is y. And then here I've got this underline because I guess I distributed the sum, right? Because there's one times the sum, there's x squared times the sum. And then this one, I knew I was going to have to do it eventually anyway. So I put the 2x in the sum. So that's why here I've got the 2 inside there, and then this is x to the 2n plus 1, because there's an extra x here being multiplied by x to the 2n when you bring it inside. Then the next line, I left the first and third ones alone, at least for now, but then the x squared, I brought that into this sum, which is why down here it's 2n plus 1 now instead of 2n minus 1. Because when you get down here, it's 2n minus 1 plus 2 from that x squared being brought inside the sum. Then the next thing is, going back to what the last couple of examples were like, you want to have the same power of x in all three sums. Well, these two already have 2n plus 1, so I'm just going to aim for that and see if I can just get all three to have 2n plus 1. That way I only have to play around with one of them. So I need to get that to be a 2n plus 1, not a 2n minus 1. But if you increase n by 1, then you'd have 2 times the quantity n plus 1 minus 1, which is 2n plus 2 minus 1, which is 2n plus 1. So that's what I did here. So really, I just went up 1 on, on all three of these and then down one on the index, or you can see it on the index, one from one to zero. But then here, n to n plus one, and then two times n to two times the quantity n plus one, which is two n plus two. Be careful with that, that's a really easy mistake to make, to write that as two n plus one, so two n plus two. And then the power two n plus two minus one is two n plus one. Okay, good, so now, x to the 2n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 1. Now we can fool around with the index on the sum. So 0, 1, 0. Okay, we can get it to where they all start with 1. We're just going to have to pull one term off of this sum, and we're going to have to pull one term off of this sum over here. Okay, if we do that, here's the first term for the sum that's on the left. Right? If n is 0, you're going to get negative 1 to the first power, times um, what, 2, right? 2 times 0 plus 2, and then times x to the first power, right? So it's negative 1 times 2x. This right here is the first term of the sum that's over here on the right, because if n is 0, you get negative 1 to the 0 times 2 times x to the first power. So that's this. And then that way, you can combine them all together, because then you'd have three sums that all have the same power of x and all start at the same index, which now would be one. So I just went ahead and did it in this step where I have the sum from n equals one to infinity of, here's this piece from the first sum, then here's this piece from the second, here's this piece from the third, and that whole thing is multiplied by x to the two n plus one. Okay, well then these terms here, we have minus two x plus two x, so this ultimately is zero. But then inside the brackets, if I clean this up a little, specifically these last two terms here, um, if I just kind of write this as, I guess with the minus one to the n factored out, you'd have minus one to the n times two n plus two. However, minus one to the n and minus one to the n plus one always have opposite signs. No matter what you pick for n, one of those is one and the other one is negative one which means that what's inside the brackets is always going to be zero. That's a thing, and like this is the kind of stuff that shows up here where those are the kinds of patterns that you end up having to be able to recognize in order to shrink things down. Where you look at this and you go, 
okay, 2n plus 2, 2n plus 2, something might be up with this. And then you have negative 1 being raised to consecutive powers. So those always have to have opposite signs. So for any value of n, this is a 0, which means that this whole expression is 0, right? Because this is also 0. So yeah, that's sum. It ends up being 0, and that means that it worked, right? We've verified the solution that when you sub in that sum, that power series for y, then you do get zero, which means that the power series satisfies that differential equation. This last example is really the bridge into section 6.2. And if you're looking at this differential equation here and you're going, wait a minute, why would I use a series? Like we did this at the beginning of the semester. You could just use an integrating factor to solve that. That is correct. However, um, as kind of an intermediate step, because when we get into 6.2, it's all second order, I wanted to have a first order one, and it's easier to control the length of the first order ones too. So it was easier to make kind of an intermediate step out of a first order equation. But yes, you can solve that with an integrating factor. You could also solve it by separation of variables. If you're looking at that and thinking, this is not the most efficient way of doing it with the series, you're right, but it's really just a lead into the next thing. All right, so if we're going to have a power series solution to this, then it's going to be of this form. But then the derivative, and this probably looks kind of familiar. It's a generalized version of what happened in the last problem, right? It's power rule derivative, and then you're going to start the sum at n equals 1 to n equals 0 because that first term of y, when you take its derivative, it's a constant, so you take the derivative and you're going to get 0, right? So you don't need that, um, that n equals 0 term. All right, so then what we're going to do is we're going to sub in. So there's y prime plus 4 times y equals 0. All right, then first things first, we want to match up the exponents. So I figured x to the n was probably going to be the best move. So this one's already set. This one here, we got to go up 1, which means we're going up 1 on the n here, and we're going up 1 here. So that's what we've got here, c to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 times x to the n. Then we got to go down 1 on the start of the summation, so n equals 1. Now that's n equals 0. Oh, look, that worked out perfectly, because all we were really aiming for right here was getting the powers of x to match up, but by doing that, we also got the indexing to match up. So we're good to go, right? We can just turn this into a single sum right now. So that's what we're going to do. Turn that into a single sum. All right, c sub n plus 1 times n plus 1 plus 4 uh, c sub n, like all that times x to the n equals 0. But for that to be equal to 0, because x can vary, you need the thing inside the brackets to be 0. Okay, that's the next step. Or we could say that c sub n plus 1 equals negative 4 c n over n plus 1. So this is just solve for c sub n plus 1 which I did because then this is actually the tough part coming up next, um, which is to try to discern the pattern that shows up when you start subbing in values of n. So you would start where n equals 0, right? That's where our summation begins. So when n is 0, then c1, right? Because then you would have c with a subscript of 0 plus 1, um, would be equal to negative 4 times c0 over 1, which is just negative 4 c0. Okay. Next would be n equals 1. That would be the next term. So then you'd have c2, right, because now the subscript here is 1 plus 1, equal to negative 4 c1, right, because here that's just the n, over 1 plus 1, which is 2. But then we know that c1 is negative 4 c0, so I'm going to sub that in. We have negative 4 times negative 4 C0 in the numerator. You could simplify that down because you go, well, that's 16 over 2, so that's 8 C0. And I simplified this one basically just so I could say this right next to it. It's actually in your best interest not to simplify it all the way. If there are things that have like exponents in them, like how we're getting this repeated negative 4, it's probably better just to write that as negative 4 quantity squared because then it's easier to see the patterns. So like it says here, you can simplify if you want to, but it's best to only like halfway simplify, if that makes sense, like how these are written. This is kind of what you want. 
um, where you're not really simplifying, but you're sort of combining things together that are similar. So instead of leaving it this way, I said, well, there are three negative fours multiplied together, so that's negative four cubed. So just like doing little things like that to sort of unclutter the expressions, but not really simplifying all the way, right? Because I'm not writing this as negative 32 over three. Um, but th this is probably about what you want here. Um, that just takes a little bit of getting used to where you only like start to simplify but don't finish it to try to see what the patterns are. But then I did the next couple as well. If n equals two, then it's the same kind of pattern where c3 is negative four, c2 over three. But c2 we already know, it's this one. I would use this, because then if you stick that in there, then you got three negative fours multiplied together, and then times c0, and then two times three, which is six on the bottom, and if you see the two and then the six, then you probably want to be thinking factorials, especially because the next one has a 24. So the next one, C4, it would be negative four times C3 over four, but C3 is this right here. So then I sub that in. So now simplifying this slightly, that's negative four to the fourth times C0, and then in the bottom it's six times four, which is 24. And I think now you can probably see it, right? This is a factorial on the bottom, right? That's a two factorial, three factorial, four factorial. And then, um, and notice like it matches the index, right? C4 has a four factorial. C4 also has negative four raised to the fourth power, right? Like how C3 has the negative four raised to the third power with a three factorial. C2 has got negative four squared with a two factorial. So I think now you can kind of see what's going on here. And so generally, that's what's happening. Where c sub n is negative 4 raised to the power of n times c0 over n factorial. Right? That's what we're getting out of this. Okay. Well, then, the way that we had our initial power series written was that it was the sum from 0 to infinity of c sub n times x to the n. But c sub n is this, so I just subbed it in directly. Or, since c0 at this point is just some arbitrary constant, you can bring it out front, and then it would be multiplied by the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 4 to the n times x to the n over n factorial. And I guess if you want to, you could combine these in the numerator and say that's negative 4x all raised to the nth power. And I do it here because I wanted to point this out. If you did do it the old way, um, you'll get this, basically because this summation that's right here, um, so the, the sum part leaving off the arbitrary constant, yeah, you can combine those together um, as negative 4x all raised to the nth power, but this is the Maclaurin series expansion of e to the negative 4x, right? Because the, the expansion of e to the x, um, you would have the sum of x to the n over n factorial, so now you just have a negative 4x instead of an x, so that's e to the negative 4x. And if you solve that first order equation the way that we were doing it like in January, so you could do it with an integrating factor. It's kind of set up for the integrating factor actually. Or you could do it with separation of variables if you wanted to. Either way, the solution that you'll get is this, which is this, right? Just not written with a series, right? Arbitrary constant times e to the negative 4x. So it does work. Um, and yes, for this particular example, doing it with series takes far longer than using an integrating factor or any of that other earlier stuff. And then I just wrote out a check. Um, so if you want to check your work, this is what it looks like, where what we would have for y, um, so I just expanded out the first few terms of the series. So I have the c0 out front, um, but then that first term, you, you would just end up with a 1 because you're going to have with negative four to the zero, x to the zero over zero factorial, right? Um, and then if n is one, you're just gonna get this. And then if n is two, right? Because n is two, you get negative four quantity squared times x squared up there. And then that's if n is three. I simplified those a little bit um, to the extent that I could. And then also y prime. So like you just took the derivative of what's inside the brackets. 
Then derivative of 1 is 0, derivative of negative 4x is negative 4, derivative of 8x squared is 16x, derivative of negative 32 thirds x cubed is negative 32x squared, right? So then I kind of line these up where the exponents matched, because then if you look at these, you go, oh, the ones in y prime are just negative 4 times the ones that are in y. That's the idea. So then if y prime is equal to negative 4y, that would mean that y prime plus 4y equals 0, which was what that differential equation was that we started off with. So this looks like it works. So everything checks out.